All right, uh, thank you uh, everyone for uh, joining me today for another installment of uh, Zoom Grand Rounds. Um, I have no uh, disclosures. It's a uh, very odd um, giving a uh, talk to a remote audience, um, but on the uh, plus side, because uh, I can't see or hear anybody, um, I'm gonna just assume that all my jokes killed. Um, as, as I said, this is, these last few months have been very strange, and you can see how some of us have coped with the stress. Uh, if you're like me, you've uh, gained a few extra pounds these past few months, and uh, now I'm going to give you an opportunity to lose a few of those pounds. Um, what you call your body is a collection of around 40 trillion human cells. Um, there are varying estimates, but uh, we appear to share our bodies with around 100 trillion um, microbial cells. And these combined microbes uh, have a biomass that's around two and a half kilograms. And uh, I like to think that I'm not responsible for those five pounds. Um, and so there you go, you just lost five pounds. And that's what I'm gonna be talking about today is the uh, microbes that we share our bodies with and how they are implicated in human health and disease and specifically in cancer. So let's take a uh, cue from Ms. Frizzle and uh, see what we can learn from the uh, world of microbiome, microbes and uh, our microbiome. Next slide, okay. Um, so on this journey, I would like to uh, talk a little bit about how we uh, identify the microbiome and define it, um, explain how it has a role in human uh, health and diseases, specifically in cancer um, uh, development and progression, and just briefly touch on its impact on cancer treatment. Um, you, it's very easy to get bogged down in the details of these kind of this, this research. There's a lot of uh, different bacterial species and uh, molecular pathways and so on, um, but I don't think that's going to be very interesting for most of us. So I want to make this more generally applicable uh, and provide a little bit of background before we delve into sort of the, the more detailed issues. So how do we define the microbiome? Well, it is strictly defined as the collection of the sum total of the genetic material um, from our microbiota. Um, more colloquially though, it's used just to describe all the aggregated um, uh, microbes that live uh, on our bodies, within our tissues, and within the human uh, biofluids. To clarify some of this overlapping usage, uh, the term um, metagenome has been used. Looks like someone sent me a chat. Let me just make sure. No, gotcha. Okay. Um, it has been developed to explain just the genetic material separate from uh, the actual microbes themselves. Similar to how we are outnumbered by microbial cells on our body, we're actually outnumbered by microbial genes. Uh, we inherit around 22,000 human genes from our parents, um, but we actually live with around 20 million microbial genes and for, moreover, our, our genome is largely static. Um, there are obviously epigenetic changes and mutations that happen through our lifetime, but more or less it's the same genes that we were born with. But our microbiome is very dynamic. Um, each of us that's listening in, we share 99.9% .9 of our human genome. Um, our, the differences are quite small, but every one of us has about an 80 to 90% different, uh, percent different microbiome uh, if we look at our hands or our guts. The microbiome includes uh, bacteria, archaea, viruses, uh, protists, and fungi, uh, all of which can contribute to our ecology. Uh, but most of the research is focused on uh, bacteria, and um, I, that's what I will focus on in this talk as well. So how do we define the microbiome? Uh, most of you that are watching will probably not recognize uh, what this is. Uh, this might help. That is actually a working microscope, and that's Anton uh, von Leeuwenhoek, uh, who was a 17th century Dutch microscope maker and considered to be the father of microbiology. So that little uh, microscope, uh, he could actually put lenses that could magnify about 250x, uh, far outpacing his contemporaries at the time, like Robert Hooke. He was actually a, a Dutch businessman, and he was interested in looking at textiles to see the quality of the fabrics, but he soon turned his lens on more interesting subjects, uh, mainly his spit and his poop. And the first description of bacteria was actually performed by Leeuwenhoek 
in about uh, in the 1680s, uh, and they were from his mouth, and he identified a specific uh, genus of uh, bacterium that are large and uh, modal, um, and that was the first bacterium that was ever visualized by human beings. And he was also the first to note that there seemed to be a distinct set of microbes uh, between his GI tract and his mouth, uh, and he, he described that in the 17th century. But today we depend on a whole different set of tools to uh, define what our microbiome is. The first studies into our microbial communities depended on clonal culture methods, um, that is cultivating the bacteria and culture to be able to uh, sequence them. But they were only able to identify around 1% of the bacteria and archaea um, that we know exist. And uh, moreover, uh, they, uh, we, they basically didn't, weren't able to include viruses um, and, and other microbes in, in, their, uh, in defining the microbiome. Today, uh, we use the revolution of modern genomics from Sanger sequencing now on to uh, next generation sequencing or high throughput sequencing to characterize the microbiome in a much deeper way. Most of this work has happened since the 2000s. Um, the Human Microbiome Project, which is uh, funded by the NIH, started in 2007, uh, sequencing around 300 uh, microbiomes. Two major uh, techniques are used is 16S ribosomal RNA sequencing and whole metagenome shotgun sequencing. In shotgun sequencing, the DNA is randomly fragmented multiple times, which produces multiple, uh, millions of short sequences that are read in parallel uh, by uh, reassembling them into overlapping sequences. The 16S RNA method, um, ribosomal RNA method, which is also known as 16S barcoding, is far less expensive, uh, both in terms of experimental costs and computational costs, um, and it allows for much larger scale studies, therefore, and that is what most of the data that will be presenting uses. The 16S ribosomal RNA uh, gene is highly conserved among bacteria and archaea, uh, but it, it so makes it a very useful primer, uh, but it also includes um, about nine highly variable regions that allow for taxonomic uh, identification, at least down to the genus level uh, and oftentimes species level, uh, based on existing databases of published uh, 16S RNA sequences. Additional techniques uh, have also been developed, including uh, microarray techniques and multi-locus sequencing, uh, as well as uh, techniques looking at the uh, protein byproducts and metabolic byproducts of our microbiomes. Efforts have actually now been uh, commercialized, so you can even get your own microbiome sequence for about $99, which is sort of like 23andMe. They're basically trying to close the gap between the 30 million or so human genomes that have been sequenced uh, compared to or only around 10,000 uh, microbiomes that have been sequenced. Uh, this is a part of a larger project called the Human Food Project or the Earth Microbiome Project, which tries to clarify geographical variation in the microbiome and the role of diet. Um, you can even get your dog's microbiome sequence, although I don't think your dog will be too happy about how you have to collect that. Uh, woof indeed. Um, but there's actually evidence that uh, cohabitation with dogs actually impacts our microbiomes as well as theirs. Um, so it, this actually could be useful in understanding how it, it implicates uh, human health. There's an offshoot of the Human Microbiome Project, which is called the Human Oral Microbiome Database. And it actually provides about uh, 300 microbial genomic, uh, full genomic sequencing of around 770 identified prokaryotic species within the oral cavity itself. And they are expanding to include uh, proteomic data. Uh, today, you can actually pull the sequencing data for the bacterial genre that von Leeuwenhoek uh, identified as the first bacteria that was visualized back in the 1600s. When we look at all this data uh, of uh, trying to classify our microbiome, specifically the oral microbiome, uh, we find that it's actually second in diversity uh, only to the GI tract or the colon. A milliliter of saliva has about 10 to the eighth number of microbe cells. Um, and only about 57% of the identified bacterial species have actually been named. Uh, so this is an opportunity for maybe some of us to be immortalized. We can get our own oral flora named after us. In the oral floor, uh, uh, oral cavity, the phyla uh, uh, firmicutes, uh, which includes streptococci, uh, 
uh, proteobacteria, which includes Neisseria, Haemophilus, uh, Actinobacteria, which are Carinobacterium and Actinomyces, and uh, Bacterioides species, which include, uh, or genus, I should say, which include Prevotella, and Fusobacteria are the most common. And it turns out that the oral cavity itself contains distinct smaller niches that are driven by things like the availability of oxygen, uh, how which nutrients are metabolized, uh, the pH effects of saliva on certain surfaces, and also bacterial features, uh, including their ability to form biofilms um, that make different niches. Three separate groupings have sort of been identified within uh, the oral cavity. The first is the buccal, uh, the uh, gingival and palatal mucosa. Uh, the second is salivary oropharynx or tonsil um, and tongue microbiome. And uh, the third is gingival plaque. So they each are enriched in various different kinds of uh, genre of bacteria. Uh, for example, Carinibacterium is quite enriched in, in dental plaque, um, while buccal mucosa habitat is richer in uh, Firmicutes uh, genera. Um, however, since these niches, niches tend to have some overall similar microbiome compositions, uh, except at the lower taxonomic levels, many researchers consider um, the, to treat the oral cavity as an, a single habitat. Uh, with different what they call stomatypes, which is borrowed from the GI uh, microbiome uh, enterotype uh, concept, uh, which is basically that they vary in ratios of abundance of these bugs rather than the specific uh, bugs themselves. Uh, in ecology, the terms used to describe this, uh, these distinctions are alpha diversity and beta diversity. Uh, alpha diversity basically tells you the species richness and diversity, i.e. how many different species are there and uh, what are the breakdown of um, abundance of the different species. Beta diversity asks uh, how different is this microbial composition in one ecosystem versus another ecosystem. If you look at the upper aerodigestive niches, there are several. Um, we talked about how the oral cavity itself has my, um, other micro niches. Uh, the oropharynx and nasal cavities um, are both dominant in uh, Firmicutes, but the oropharynx has increased uh, diversity compared to the nasal cavity. Uh, the nasal cavity is dominated more by staph species, while the oropharynx has more strep species. Um, and again, you can look at the other, uh, the, the graphic to look at what are the more common um, uh, genus of uh, the bugs that we see, uh, including down in the larynx, uh, which again is, is sort of a, a continuum with the oral cavity and oropharynx, and we see a lot of Firmicutes species and Fusobacterium bacterioides just like the oral cavity. So what have we learned through all these different techniques? Uh, first is that early colonization events are extremely powerful. So we're actually colonized within 20 minutes of delivery. Um, and we know that C-section babies have a different predominance of flora, specifically they have skin flora rather than uh, maternal vaginal canal flora. And this founder effect is uh, pretty strong and thought to be associated with later development of um, things like obesity, asthma, allergies, uh, and even diabetes. Um, there's actually evidence that during pregnancy, uh, hormonal changes promote a different vaginal microbiome that is thought to be uh, uh, helpful or beneficial for the, the birth, baby after birth. And this actually changes during pregnancies and returns to its sort of baseline afterwards. Um, so there's evidence that swabbing newborns with the maternal birth canal flora that are C-section babies may be able to mitigate some of these uh, deleterious effects that are starting to be recognized uh, and to recover some of that lost microbial diversity. Second, if we look at the microbiome over time, so there's that initial uh, colonization event, uh, and then we see that there's a rapid increase in diversity over the first couple of years in life. And by about age three, we sort of reach a baseline that is very similar uh, to our adult microbiome. In fact, it's hard to distinguish our, our, adult micro, our adult microbiome after about age three from, uh, sorry, once we're about three years old, it looks like our adult microbiome. Um, so we get this sort of baseline microbiome that can resist changes, um, including even strong effects like antibiotic exposure and illnesses, um, which do change it, but then eventually we tend to return to normal. In that early period, there are several inflection points. Obviously, it's things like the mode of delivery, which are important. Um, as are the introduction of breast milk and solid foods, as well as early childhood illnesses, especially uh, when uh, babies have fevers or are exposed to antibiotics. 
Others are driven by nutritional requirements, other changes. Um, so babies uh, need gut bacteria to make folate, whereas adults can get most of their folate through their diet. So folate producing bacteria predominate in early childhood. Um, and our maternal microbiomes actually do endure, but they're diluted rapidly through this process. It, by adulthood, um, our microbiome is sort of uh, split between our parents, uh, or both our parents. Um, that is, we share around half of our microbiome with our mother and father. And so this is actually our second inherited genome. Um, the, but this genome is more likely driven by changes in uh, nurture rather than nature, because we know that environmental effects have a much bigger impact than uh, genetic effects. So diet, physical environment, close contact ex uh, can explain around 25% of the variability of our microbiome, uh, which is much greater than the effect of host genetics. Um, household members, and particularly spouses, share more microbiota than, uh, than genetically related pairs that live apart. By around age 65, the diversity of our microbiome starts to go down once again, and we all become more similar in our microbiomes as we age. In this study here, uh, basically, it showed that uh, genetic relationships are less important than basically cohabitation, where cohabiting mothers and fathers were far more similar uh, to each other and their children than members of different families, for example. Third, we see that inter-individual uh, variability is quite high, but there seems to exist a sort of uh, human core microbiome that is relatively preserved across multiple um, human populations. It does change, uh, while we do have individual microbiomes that are unique and so we can be identified by our microbiome, as we look at microbiome data around the world, we're starting to see that geographical differences may not play such a huge role. So this figure above comes from a study that looked at salivary samples from 12 sites around the world, uh, two from each geographical region. And when you compared individuals from the same sites and same regions, there was greater diversity than when you compared it from necessarily different uh, geographical sites. So basically individuals from, diversity was about the same from individuals in the same location as they were from individuals from different locations, suggesting that um, living in different countries or so on is not necessarily what implicates uh, the diversity of our microbiomes. Finally, what is far, uh, while we do have this core microbiome, it is extremely site specific. So we talked about the oral cavity and upper air density niches. And those um, niches are much, much more responsible for variability than even between individuals. So microbiome niches, when they're examined over time, uh, will change, but we can still identify what site they came from. So one study looked at uh, computer keyboards and they were able to identify not only uh, who was using the computer well, by swabbing the, the microbes on the keyboard, but even uh, which hand and which fingers were being used to strike different keys. Uh, so this is a different kind of uh, fingerprinting that can be performed through uh, microbial analysis. Ethnic differences also don't seem to uh, dramatically influence the variability within our flora either. In this study from 2016, uh, three skin flora sites were um, sampled from uh, men from six different ethnic groups. And when you look at the sequencing data, what clustered was actually the site or what they called the ecological zone uh, rather than the ethnic group. And any differences that were uh, between ethnic groups, which did, they were able to elucidate some uh, differences, but they were basically uh, tiny compared to the, uh, the body site that they were taken from. So all these studies reveal that our microgeography is much more important to our microbial diversity than uh, macrogeography, such as where we live. Um, and individuals' uh, sites are much more uh, uh, similar than differences between people, meaning my hands and your hands will share a lot more microbes than uh, my hand and my gut, for example. The last two decades have seen an explosion of insights using these uh, sequencing technologies into the role of microbiome in human health and diseases. The gut microbiome has been the one that's been most characterized, especially in its interaction with the GI tract, which itself has been called a second immune system or second brain. 
the uh, gut associated lymphoid tissue actually contains about 70% of the immune cells in our body and about 80% of the plasma cell stores. And the enteric nervous system, for example, contains about 100 uh, million uh, neurons, which is more than our spinal cord and peripheral nervous system combined. Um, for example, 80% of the uh, vagus nerve is actually comprised of afferent fiber, fibers that actually are carrying sensory information uh, back to the uh, back from the, the gut primarily back to the brain, rather than the kind of things that we think about the vagus nerve doing. Um, so perhaps its role is actually more important in taking information from the enteric nervous system of the gut. Microbiota, we know, influence several basic biological processes, including the modulation of metabolic phenotypes, uh, regulation of epithelial development, and the driving of innate immunity. Human microbiota actually also perform a function of a physical barrier through competitive exclusion of, of pathogenic bacteria and other microbes and they produce antimicrobial substances themselves. We know, for example, that germ-free mice um, uh, and other animal models are deficient in several kinds of immune cells, and they have poorly formed lymphoid structures, such as spleens and lymph nodes. Infectious disease is, of course, how we most readily recognize the impact of microbes on our health, but alterations in microbiota have been uh, implicated in a whole host of human diseases. Uh, including the ones that I've listed here on this uh, site, on this uh, slide. Uh, the oral microbiome also has a significant role, obviously within localized oral disease, uh, but has been much less extensively characterized than the GI tract. So there's about a thousand papers in the literature about the oral microbiome versus over 5,000 papers about uh, the GI tract. Um, as expected, oral microbi microbiome uh, microbiomes um, have an impact on local oral health, like oral overgrowth of certain kinds of uh, bacteria have been associated with dental caries, periodontitis, um, as well as oral cancer, which we'll get to soon. Uh, for example, P. gingivalis, uh, but, uh, it, sorry, but it actually can play a significant role in other systemic diseases um, through sort of uh, maybe direct linking to the pulmonary tract and uh, distal GI tract, uh, but also through the high rich vascularity of the oral cavity. Um, there are examples, for example, of P. gingivalis, which uh, produces metabolites that can trigger system, systemic uh, cytokine release and uh, drive systemic inflammation. It can, that same bacteria has been implicated in the production of amyloid plaques and dysregulation of tau metabolism and has actually been found in the brains of patients with Alzheimer's. Um, and that same bacterium has even been found in ath colonizing atherosclerotic plaques um, and may be associated with uh, cardiovascular disease as well. So we are just starting to learn about how the oral microbiome and the, and the head and neck microbiome in general may be uh, producing and contributing to the conditions that we take care of. So on the left here, we see a study that looked at a uh, Dana study that looked um, at uh, the microbiome uh, of uh, tonsil tissue, uh, both in adults and in children. Uh, with either uh, sleep apnea or with uh, tonsillitis. And this study showed that adults who had chronic tonsillitis or recurrent tonsillitis were enriched in specific bacteria like Fusobacterium and Strep intermedius, um, but did not really ever uh, see or rarely saw the bugs that were seen in uh, acute tonsillitis like Strep pyogenes or Staph aureus. The otologic microbiome has been less well characterized. Um, one study looking at children with middle ear effusions found no difference uh, between recurrent acute otitis media and uh, chronic uh, serous otitis media. But that study really looked at uh, three bacterium that are common uh, causes of, of uh, acute otitis media, uh, strep pneumonia, H. flu, Moraxella, and 15 respiratory viruses. And they used uh, culture and PCR methods. When we look at 16S RNA uh, data of the middle ear and uh, adenotonsillar tissue, studies show that the adenoid and tonsil cluster together in the kind of microbes that live in them. But the adenoid sort of serves as a bridge, meaning it shares some of its micro, uh, microbes with the common pathogenic middle ear uh, flora, with which uh, 
suggests that it may be a reservoir for pathogenic uh, middle ear bacterium, and it supports the role of ad uh, adenoidectomy in uh, the treatment of uh, otitis, kids with otitis. Sinonasal microbiome studies have looked at, for example, uh, composition between chronic rhinosinusitis participants and healthy controls, uh, which showed things like an increase in staph aureus and anaerobes in uh, CRS patients. However, a significantly larger number of studies have shown actually that it's just a reduced overall microbiome diversity that's seen in CRS uh, rather than specific pathogenic strains. Um, and it's revealed things like antibiotic use may actually contribute to recalcit recalcitrant uh, CRS by fragmenting our healthy microbial communities and further reducing um, the diversity of our sinonasal microbiome. Fewer studies have looked at the laryngeal uh, microbiome and metagenomic studies have shown reduced microbial diversity uh, and increased relative abundances of strep and helicobacter, uh, among others in smokers, for example. Um, when looking at reflux laryngitis, uh, there was a, a hypothesis that GI tract flora can uh, get up from our gut into our larynx and that might be a putative mechanism of why we, we develop reflux laryngitis. Uh, but reflux status, when we look at the microbiome, did not seem to impact microbial diversity at the larynx. Um, and uh, other laryngeal studies have shown that uh, patients with healthy uh, laryngeal mucosa and those with benign vocal fold disease um, had similar uh, abundance of uh, streptococcus, uh, or sorry, of most flora, but had an abundance of streptococcus in the patients that had benign uh, vocal fold disease. So, where are we in terms of understanding how the microbiome impacts our health? Well, our current state is really a characterization of the microbiome composition, and it is just starting to develop mechanistic studies to understand how the microbiome can produce either health or disease. Ultimately, we don't know that there is any single, or we know that there's no single normal or healthy microbiome, but we do know that there is probably a core microbiome with health associated features. That is, it has a high level of diversity, it is resistant to uh, short-term perturbations, but can react by changing and becoming plastic to long-term pressures. It generally produces a beneficial host immune response uh, and provides metabolic mutualism uh, to the host. But we need to move from understanding the structure to uh, a functional understanding of the microbiome. Most of the studies that look at health and disease are associational and are complicated by what I described before, which is the higher degree of inter-individual variation between microbiomes, uh, rather than any association with a single disease state. Uh, there, are there are basically a incredible degree of diversity between individuals who we'd consider uh, all healthy, even though they might have completely different microbiomes. And these differences, can arise through a complex combination of environmental, genetic, and lifestyle factors. Uh, this means that relatively subtle differences can have a disproportionate role in determining whether an individual is classified as relatively healthy or at increased risk of developing a specific disorder, and those subtle differences are hard to detect. The concept that we should be using is not that a specific change is directly responsible, but that there is a dysbiosis or a change from the, the core microbiome, uh, and that this causes a functional change rather than an ecological change, meaning it's not just the fact that the bugs changed, but that there was a functional effect of that change that is actually driving a disease state. And we're just not there yet in terms of uh, characterizing the, the mechanisms behind this. However, the literature does suggest that there are um, disease states that we can uh, capture uh, based on the alpha diversity uh, changes. Um, one other caveat is that most of these studies are done in uh, the United States or Europe, uh, in North America or in, uh, in China, and don't capture necessarily the full diversity um, of these minor microbiome changes. Um, so we need lot more longitudinal and uh, global studies to really understand this better. We ultimately don't have enough uh, data to satisfy the Koch postulates or um, Hill's criteria for how our microbes cause specific diseases. Um, 
but oncogenesis might be able to provide a uh, example of where infectious agents have been shown to directly cause cancer, and therefore we can understand the role of our microbiome in a, in a uh, more nuanced fashion. Um, lo I love this clip from Arrested Development. I heard the jury's still out on science. Um, and so I guess the jury's still out on science, but we're starting to figure things out. So when we look at microbes and their role in cancer, um, we actually have several examples of direct oncogenic pathogens. So malignancy is responsible for about one in every six deaths worldwide, and it's expected to increase by about an incidence of 70% over the next 20 years. On the left here are WHO class one pathogens that, um, and are in agreement with the International Agency for Research on Cancer as uh, direct causes of cancer. Um, in the head and neck, we know several examples of viral uh, oncogenesis, including HPV, EBV, uh, Merkel cell, and human herpes virus 8. And these are truly carcinogenic uh, pathogens with mechanisms into their um, oncogenic potential. So we're familiar with HPV, which integrates into its, the host genome and produces the early proteins 6 and 7, which uh, inactivate tumor suppressor genes. EBV is less well understood, but it does produce other uh, viral oncoproteins um, that uh, are known to induce malignant transformation in mouse models. And uh, the, the best studied example of bacterial oncogenesis is Helicobacter by, uh, uh, pylori, which leads to gastric um, uh, mucosal associated lymphoma um, and gastric adenocarcinoma. In fact, it's the only bacteria that reaches the standards of the WHO and the, um, as a uh, class one carcinogen. Uh, there are other bacteria that are uh, also uh, have strong evidence for a uh, role in cancer development, including Salmonella typhi and uh, Chlamydia pneumoniae in uh, gallbladder cancer and uh, lung cancer, respectively. Um, but H. pylori is, is the one that's best understood. Uh, we know that it drives localized mucosal inflammation um, directly, but also produces toxigenic um, factors like CAG-A, which is a vir virulence factor which can uh, dysregulate the gastric mucosal um, uh, uh, oncoproteins. Um, still, we know that there are a complex set of host pathogen interactions that actually determine whether a cancer actually develops. So 95% of the world population has been exposed to EBV, uh, and 50% of the world is known to carry H. pylori, but obviously not every one of those uh, individuals develops MPC or gastric cancer. Uh, worldwide, uh, these direct carcinogens are responsible for around 2 million new cases of cancer every year, uh, which is um, in some studies they, close to 20%, but uh, in a 2008 study, it was around 16% of new cancer cases that year. Um, but there is a growing body of evidence that it's not just these bacteria or viruses, but the host microbiome interactions that can actually potentiate or mitigate the risk from these infections. In notobiotic studies, uh, in germ-free mice, for example, H. pylori infection does not induce um, gastric cancer without a gut microbiome, suggesting that there may be a role of the inflammatory milieu that is actually carried out. Uh, from the H. pylori infection that actually leads to the uh, tumors. The microbiome is likely at least necessary to drive this oncogenesis in H. pylori. Uh, periodontitis, which is associated with uh, HPV, uh, mediated oropharynx cancer, uh, also has a putative mechanism which is, relates to its ability to disrupt the uh, mucosal surface and uh, cause loss of epithelial tissue and epithelial bar barrier, which actually exposes the a basal lymphocyte population, which now makes it more uh, uh, able to be a reservoir for that HPV infection, uh, driving HPV-related oropharynx cancer. So there's not just the oncogenic uh, pathogens, but a host microbiome relationship that is probably driving the production of these uh, tumors. But the relationship isn't always straightforward one-to-one, -one, meaning uh, the microbiome is not uh, only cancer causing, but it can actually help eliminate cancer risk. Uh, in, he in hepatitis B, for example, an adult gut microbiome is actually needed for anybody to clear hepatitis B virus and prevent the development of hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, 
Uh, more and more microbe alterations are being described in a variety of human cancers. Uh, tumors on their mucosal surfaces can show alterations of microbial flora on the tumor tissue itself, um, but tumor adjacent tissue also shows these uh, microbe changes that are distinct. Um, and in fact, there can be systemic effects uh, that can be related by driving systemic inflammation or um, metabolic or hormonal effects that can go through the circulation and affect distant tissues as well. The best characterized example of microbiome associated uh, oncogenesis is uh, fusobacteria in colorectal cancer. Um, it is a ubiquitous commensal organism that is found throughout the dental plaque and throughout, sorry, the GI tract and including in the oral cavity and dental plaque. They have been found to be enriched in basically all colorectal carcinomas and in fact, a uh, big proportion of colonic adenomas as well, that is precancellar lesions, and have even been found in metastatic uh, colorectal carcinoma disease, both within lymph nodes and within distant mets in the liver. We, we know through mechanistic studies that germ-free mice and mice that are treated with antibiotics uh, or cultivated free of um, fusobacteria are actually um, all right, I just got a message from Dr. Um, are actually uh, have attenuated tumor development. So fusobacteria has actually been mechanistically linked to the develop or the necessity for uh, actually driving uh, tumors. Um, we know in terms of the biological pathways that uh, it produces, uh, expresses fat A, which can bind to E cadherin and uh, trigger upregulation of oncogenes like MYC and cyclin D. Uh, colonization of uh, this bacteria actually can reduce the surrounding gut microbial diversity, leading to altered metabolisms of short-chain fatty acids, which have been independently linked to colorectal cancer development. The bacteria can also trigger inflammatory cascades in endothelial cells by its interaction with uh, toll-like receptor signalings. So that's the best characterized example, which is in colorectal cancer. And now when we turn our attention to uh, head and neck cancer, um, the oral cavity microbiome, which is, again is, is the best characterized within the head and neck, has also been shown to have alterations that are associated with uh, head and neck cancers, specifically oral cancer. Interestingly, one of the bacteria um, that is found to be significantly enriched in oral cavity uh, cancers is the gram-negative fusobacterium, which is found in colorectal cancers as well as well as other uh, GI species like bacteroides, which are also associated with colorectal cancer. Uh, so these may be our best putative uh, uh, microbiome uh, associated oncogenic factors. Um, and we know that uh, in oral cancer, other species like streptococcus are diminished, um, which are normal flora. So sort of the normal oral flora is disrupted in a lot of these uh, cancer studies. But it's not clear whether it's the cancer associated microbiome that is uh, acquired after a malignant transformation happens or whether it's the microbiome that is actually causing these uh, pre-malignant and malignant changes. Uh, to so understand this a little bit better, uh, there was a 2017 study by Amar et al. which showed that pre-malignant lesions like oral leukoplakia had similar enhancements as of, of the uh, flora as malignant lesions. Uh, so maybe there's a, a continuum where we're seeing micro, microbiome changes that are actually responsible, or they're just early biomarkers of these kind of dysplastic changes uh, compared to normal tissue. This uh, 2018 Taiwanese study hypothesized that cancer progression may be linked to progressive alterations in our oral microbiome. They found that oral cavity cancer stage was significantly associated with increased alpha diversity, meaning changes in the uh, flora. Uh, for example, fusobacteria, again, increased in abundance with, in regard to tumor size and invasiveness. So in healthy controls, it was uh, generally the proportion of fusobacterium was around 2.98% or 3%. And by stage one oral cavity cancer, it had increased to about 4.3%. And by stage four oral cavity cancers, uh, they had a proportion of around 8% of uh, this specific um, uh, gen genus of bacterium. Um, additional bacteria like Fusobacteria, uh, per Periodontitum, uh, Strep, Constellatus, and H. influenza are also all associated with oral cavity squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, and they also increased uh, from stage one to stage four. 
while other uh, genera of bacteria decreased with stage. Uh, perhaps the most intriguing aspect of this study was the possibility of prognostic information from microbiome alterations. By integrating the most significant microbiome changes in just three bacterial species, the Taiwanese group was able to distinguish stage four oral cavity cancer patients from healthy controls uh, in a validation cohort that they uh, checked it against. Um, so we may be able to look at sample the bacteria within the oral cavity and, and say that this person has oral cavity cancer um, or they don't. And even moreover, we can maybe predict what stage oral cavity cancer they have just from looking at the oral flora. We know that 85% of oral cancers associated with the classic risk factors of tobacco use, um, alcohol exposure, uh, beetle quid, and HPV status if we include uh, oral pharyngeal uh, cancers. Um, we're often taught the mnemonic of five S's, that's for the risk factors for oral cavity cancer, that's smoking, uh, spirits, uh, smooching, which is my, my PG uh, way of saying it, um, spice, which is beetle quid, and sharps, which are dentition. Um, but we may need to be adding a sixth S to that. The, the best that I can come up with is strep or maybe sepsis to help remember that to explain that 15% of oral cavity malignancies uh, that occur in the absence of exposure to these risk factors. Um, there is also a possibility through the oral microbiome to explain why everyone who is exposed to these traditional risk factors does not develop cancer. So why don't all smokers get oral cancer or lung cancer or so on, uh, perhaps it is actually the role of our microbiome that is driving this. So there are lots of studies that show that um, oral microbes can actually potentiate the effects of traditional oral carcinogens. I mentioned previously how um, microbiome changes uh, associated with poor dental hygiene could contribute to epithelial disruption and therefore a higher risk of HPV-driven uh, oncogenesis. Bacterial uh, metabolites can potenti uh, potentiate other carcinogenic xenobiotic uh, uh, compounds, such as alcohol and tobacco. Uh, for example, there are specific commensal bacteria within the oral cavity that are able to ferment ethanol into acetaldehyde, which is actually a uh, powerful genotoxin and carcinogen. Uh, alcohol by itself does not actually appear to be a carcinogen by itself, so woohoo, um, but it's the bacteria that can metabolize it and ferment it into acetaldehyde uh, that actually makes it a potent carcinogen. Um, we know that chronic uh, alcohol uh, use or um, can actually lead to a selective bias towards these bacteria that can preferentially uh, ferment alcohols um, and can actually sort of uh, exponentially increase your cancer risk the more you're exposed to alcohol. Smoking itself has been shown to alter the microbial composition within the head and neck, uh, which I mentioned previously within the larynx. Uh, tobacco smoke has been shown to reduce oxygen availability, change the acidity within the saliva. Uh, it can impair host uh, mucosal immunity um, and even alter bacterial adherence to the mucosal surfaces. Uh, conversely, the microbes themselves can alter what the tobacco smoke actually does to the mucosa. Um, Sherma et al. in this study generated 16S sequencing data from buccal mucosa in daily smokers who had head and neck cancer and those that didn't. So smokers in this study showed decreased alpha diversity uh, compared to non-smokers, which is in concordance with uh, most other studies looking at uh, smoking and uh, the uh, head and neck microbiome. But when you look at head and neck cancer patients, bacterial diversity actually increased, which is different from most uh, direct sequencing uh, studies. Possible explanations for this discrepancy in the study was because most other studies don't actually stratify based on smoking status. Uh, so maybe the effects of smoking are stronger on how the oral microbiome impacts the mucosa uh, than just uh, the presence of malignancy or the absence of malignancy, which again uh, is evidence that what is driving the production of the tumors may be the microbiome with its interaction with other carcinogens rather than uh, the reverse, which is that tumors are changing the microenvironment and changing the microbiome secondarily. Um, we, this study did not stratify uh, um, 
excuse me, the uh, other study that looked at uh, uh, disease um, oral mucosa and contralateral healthy tissue suggest that they may be localized and site specific. So maybe smoking and may not be responsible, meaning uh, smoking is generally exposed throughout the oral cavity, but we're seeing these kind of effects in sort of these micro niches. Uh, so again, there is sort of competing uh, data that is shows it in both directions. In the meta-analysis on the right, uh, smoking status was further distinguished by whether someone was a former smoker or never smoker. Smokers again showed a decline in alpha diversity uh, with tobacco exposure, uh, enriching in specific bacterial um, genus like for, uh, uh, phyla, sorry, like Firmicutes and Actinobacteria while depleting proteobacteria. Former smokers, microbial uh, compositions actually returned to a similar level as uh, individuals who never smoked, uh, showing that we can sort of recover our uh, healthy or core microbiome if through smoking cessation. Uh, but there were smaller uh, changes in bacterial communities uh, that were in common between current smokers and uh, former smokers that show maybe some small lingering effects that are never cleared uh, within our microbiome as well. Uh, the data was not in the study was not precise enough to talk about the duration of abstinence, um, but overall they did not see a clear trend between years of quitting and bacterial composition, meaning we don't know exactly how long uh, it takes for our microbiome to return to normal uh, upon smoking cessation. Briefly, I wanna look at one other area in the head and neck, um, which is sort of the only other one that's been characterized. Um, this 2014 study used 16S uh, barcoding to sequence laryngeal squamous cell carcinoma, uh, tumor adjacent uh, quote unquote normal tissue, and a separate cohort of patients with benign vocal fold polyps. All three groups showed a significant overlap in the, in the most common flora, as you can see in the Venn diagram, uh, that of you know, streptococci, fusobacterium, uh, provotella. Um, but there were 15 genera of bacteria that were found to be specifically more common in patients with squamous cell carcinoma, uh, but not um, uh, those with benign uh, vocal fold polyps. Um, so there may be bacterial related uh, drivers of uh, laryngeal squamous cell carcinoma as well. But when we think about all this data, uh, similar to our understanding of how the microbiome affects other human diseases, the relationship is quite complex when it comes to cancer as well. In 2017, a uh, consortium was founded called the International Cancer Microbiome Consortium, uh, which was launched to investigate what we call the oncomicrobiome, um, but we are far from understanding it. Two general hypotheses have been uh, described to explain how the microbiome is oncogenic. Uh, the first, uh, which is described by Sears and Peridol, is called the alpha bug hypothesis, where specific key microbes have virulence factors that are both directly oncogenic and can remodel the host to a more oncogenic phenotype. And the second is called a driver passenger model, uh, where these alpha bugs may initiate uh, the, have a, uh, a starting hit, um, but then it leads to a significant change in the diversity of the remainder of that uh, microbiome. Um, and therefore, when we look at these effects, we might actually be uh, only describing passenger effects that are actually obscuring the underlying causative agents, meaning Maybe it's microbe A that actually is triggering all the micro change, microbiome changes that we're actually capturing. And it's not the changes themselves that are um, that we are actually seeing that are causing the cancers, but one underlying uh, specific alpha bug that we're just not ever going to see based on the methods that we're currently using. And this is further complicated by the presence of most of these bacteria uh, implicated that are implicated in these um, uh, studies as normal commensal um, bacterium in low proportions in healthy mucosal surfaces. So these are all bacteria that we already have. Uh, what's changing is perhaps the proportion of these bacteria. It is possible that they reach a certain critical uh, threshold of either decreases in certain bacteria or increases in certain bacteria that reach a threshold that actually triggers inflammatory um, or local metabolic changes that are driving oncogenesis. Um, but that is still, again, yet to be elucidated. And then we have to think about what microbiome should we actually characterize to understand 
whether these changes are relevant to tumor development and progression. Is it the flora that colonized tumors themselves on their mucosal surfaces? Is it the microbiome of the tumor micro environment uh, that is tumor adjacent tissues? Um, is it the entire microbiome niche, like the entire oral cavity? Or is it the systemic ecology of an organism uh, that is driving this? We know that the gut microbiome can have significant systemic effects on uh, other parts of the body, same with the oral microbiome. So should we be studying the microbiome as a whole in an organism, or should we be looking at the oral cavity uh, by um, direct tissue sampling um, or collection of biofluids? So a lot of studies use oral rinse to collect all the genomic data, um, but perhaps we need to be actually biopsying the tissue itself. And then should we uh, look at tumor and tumor adjacent tissue in comparison to uh, matched control normal epithelium in that same individual, meaning should we just go to the contralateral or some other site and look at the uh, tissue and characterize that to be our control? Or should we compare them to individuals that don't have the disease, so cohorts that are disease-free? These are all questions that we are still just unsure about how to answer. Um, and all we're able to do is to collect this data and just say, you know, we collected it from in this method. Um, and then as we build this database, then we might be able to figure out what is actually important to, to, um, to what, what method we should use to collect the data and how we should look at it. So there's a clear uh, chicken and egg dilemma here that has just not been sorted out. Um, we know that the tumor microenvironment uh, can change the microbiome, but we also know that the microbiome can alter the, uh, the mucosa itself and lead to tumor development. Uh, we may not be able to answer this question yet, but like I uh, described earlier, there are changes that we see in precancerous or um, or dysplastic lesions that sort of mimic uh, the true uh, carcinomas, uh, which may mean that these are early changes that are happening that are driving this, or that they are biomarkers for uh, these dysplastic changes. What is ultimately exciting to me and I think to um, you know, cancer biologists and oncologists is potentially at this stage to use the microbiome as uh, a powerful biomarker for cancer development and progression. So the microbiome of tumor adjacent tissue can be altered compared to truly what we call healthy uh, epithelium that is not altered at all. And that these changes may actually precede histological changes that we can see. So the microbiome changes, whether or not they are a passenger effect or a driver, uh, may change earlier than even the histology shows us. So we may be able to capture um, early changes in a way that, in, that it's easy to capture with uh, you know, brush, um, bi sort of brush biopsies or oral rinses that we don't even need biopsies, tissue biopsies to, to um, find. Um, and finally, it may play a role in how we might do in vivo imaging of uh, tumors and dysplastic lesions uh, because we can use the microbiome uh, microbiota to sort of stain the tissue and map tumor, tumor margins perhaps. Finally, I wanna to briefly touch on how the microbiome plays a role in the um, responses to cancer treatments. Microbes, as we have seen, have been responsible for nearly 20% of cancers worldwide, but they also have provided a host of cancer treatments. So bacterial products can actually regulate cellular proliferation and can have potent tumor anti-tumor properties. So many chemotherapies that uh, you can see listed here, like mitomycin um, and the, um, uh, the rubicin drugs are actually bacterial products, most of them from strep species that have potent um, anti-DNA uh, 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 synthesis effects or proliferation effects in, in uh, human cells. Um, cancer therapeutics actually at its very foundation had a grand insight about microbes in fact impact on tumors. So uh, pictured here in the middle is uh, William Colley or William Coley, who was an orthopedic surgeon at Memorial Hospital in New York uh, at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, in this photo, he is actually standing in front of another hospital, which is now the hospital for special surgery, but back then, uh, and you can't make this up, was called the hospital for ruptured for the ruptured and the crippled. Um, well, in the 1890s, frustrated with outcomes on of sarcoma patients that were not responding to surgery, 
he started investigating additional uh, uh, therapeutic modalities and uh, looked at the injection of bacterial agents into patients to trigger a septic response to drive what we understand now was an immune attack on, on tumor cells. Uh, this was actually previously reported. Uh, the, the Mayo brothers, who famously founded Mayo Clinic, were uh, also uh, using these kind of techniques. And um, even Anton Chekhov, who uh, was himself a physician, had noted this observation in a letter he wrote to a friend in 1890, uh, explaining how infections could drive the, uh, the uh, receding of, of tumors. Um, but what Coley did, which was really important, was to keep meticulous records of which bacteria was able to produce these high fevers that were necessary to uh, produce the effect. Uh, and he made a mix of strep and other species uh, that we uh, that was called Coley's toxin and what we call Coley's toxin. Uh, he was unfortunately uh, almost d uh, discarded to the dustbins of history for almost a century because his peers didn't really believe him. Uh, he was so meticulous in how he did it that he was able to produce at least somewhat reasonably uh, uh, reproducible effects, but other uh, his peers could not do that, and so they just didn't believe him. And we also have to remember what was going on at that era, because in uh, 19, 1895, uh, which was around the time he was doing these experiments, uh, Becquerel had uh, described x-rays, um, and he and the Curies would later go on to win the Nobel in uh, 1903 uh, for the discovery of radiation. And shortly after that, uh, the use of radiation for the treatment of uh, tumors. Uh, this became heavily favored, uh, especially um, by Coley's boss, uh, at that time, who was um, uh, James Ewing of uh, Ewing sarcoma uh, fame, um, who really favored radiation therapy uh, because it was reproducible, um, but also uh, you have to even think about sort of business impacts because he was funded by mining industrialists who did not mind promoting uh, radium as a treatment for uh, cancers. Um, today, we have a very important prize in cancer immunology that's actually named after him. Um, and he is considered to be the father of, of cancer immunology. And he ha already had found this insight into how microbes may impact um, uh, cancer response, whether it's mediated through our host uh, immune system or not. Modern insights into the microbiome infect, uh, affecting how uh, chemotherapy, uh, uh, how patients respond to chemotherapy actually came from observations in uh, of reduced therapeutic effects in germ-free mice and mice that are treated with antibiotics, broad-spectrum antibiotics. So even traditional agents like cyclophosphamide and platinum drugs have been shown to be less effective in mouse models where they don't have a microbiome or are treated with uh, uh, simultaneously with antibiotics. And this is especially true for the emerging field of immunotherapies. Uh, we know that any enterically uh, delivered medication is going to in interact with our gut microbiota, of course, uh, but perhaps the most provocative data suggesting the importance of this comm commensal microbiota comes from um, the uh, uh, use of PD-1 uh, therapies in, uh, in um, different kinds of uh, tumors. So a decrease in the commensal core microbiome populations was correlated to a worse uh, patient survival in patients treated with uh, these uh, checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, furthermore, uh, and mechanistically, fecal transfer from mice that were responders to immunotherapy uh, to mice that were non-responders could, and vice versa, could actually switch the phenotype of the mouse. So we could make a mouse more responsive to uh, immunotherapies by just changing what gut microbiota they had. Uh, in human studies and in mice studies, we know that uh, in melanoma, responses to uh, ipilimumab um, and PD-1 inhibitors like uh, Pembro uh, corresponds to certain kinds of gut uh, genotypes and gut microbiomes. Um, and in head and neck cancer therapies, based on you know, just the Checkmate and the Keynote studies, uh, anti-PD-1 anti antibodies are becoming a standard of care in sort of treatment refractory head and neck uh, cancer patients. And a sub-analysis was actually performed in the Checkmate trial um, trying to correlate bacterial diversity and clinical response, and it was largely inconclusive, but there are efforts within head and neck cancer to understand whether we can predict and also alter which patients are actually uh, res responding to these treatments. 
A trial is actually underway at Princess Margaret Cancer Center in Toronto to prospectively uh, assess this in both looking at both oral and intestinal microbiota in uh, head and neck cancer patients that are being treated with definitive chemo radiation. The oral microbiome has also been shown to influence cancer uh, treatment side effects as well. Uh, we know that the dysbiosis of the oral mucosal microbiota can actually aggravate uh, mucositis from chemotherapy uh, or radiation therapy. And it has been, uh, it's being uh, assessed whether we can help mitigate those uh, by changing the, the microbiome environment. We also know that post-treatment, uh, even for example, 20 gray exposure can cause about an 80% decrease in salivary function. And therefore a subsequent uh, oral, oral uh, microbiome environment that is acidified and can actually drive the colonization of some of these putative carcinogenic species. So this is perhaps one of the ways that post-treatment uh, tumors can arise, not through just direct DNA damage, but a change in the microbiome environment based on the change in the mucosal environment due to uh, loss of uh, saliva, for example. Now there are ongoing trials uh, to assess the role of pre and probiotics to um, look at both treatment response and also mitigation of these treatment related side effects. So to wrap up, um, what we understand about the microbiome and human health and disease, including malignancy, is far less than what we probably don't understand about it. Uh, but the metagenome can clearly influence cancer initiation, progression, and treatment response in a whole host of studies that we've looked at. There is great potential in what um, I like to call the depersonalizing of personalized medicine, that is looking at not our body uh, or ourselves, but looking at our microbial community to actually drive personalized medicine. Um, there is a hope for a paradigm that uh, is depicted here where we use our microbiome analysis to tailor both diagnostics, uh, therapeutics, and surveillance based on our microbial populations. And to end uh, on a somewhat philosophical note, um, I think what is incredible about uh, what is the most incredible feature of our cohabitation with our microbiota is not how we respond to pathogenic microbes, but how we endure this mammoth number of organisms uh, that dwell in and on us in a relatively benign way. Um, uh, Walt Whitman, who, who's down there on the right in Songs of Myself, says, you know, I'm, I contain multitudes. And uh, we should look at ourselves as constantly evolving and an expanding entity. Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, who's a Buddhist monk, uh, was in, really inspired by the work of a biologist, Lewis Thomas, uh, who uh, explained that our human bodies are shared and rented and occupied by these countless organisms, and our bodies are communities. And he goes on to say that there are no solitary beings. And Thich Nhat Hanh actually coined a term for this. He calls it interbeing to describe not just this phenomenon of our microbiome, but I think our lives at large. Uh, here are my re references, and I'm happy to provide people that are interested with the actual uh, nitty gritty studies that looked at really the detailed changes and uh, mechanistic studies that um, are potentially implicated in, in not just uh, cancer, but a whole host of uh, human diseases. Happy to take any questions if there are any. Otherwise, it's already seven, so I'll, I, people can head out. Very well done, Varun. Very well done. Really outstanding. And I love the way you brought some history in, too. Yeah. Makes George feel right at home, right, George? <laughs> did you, That's did you right. Recognize, Remember, did you recognize the uh, that, first microscope? Dr. Yes, I, sure. <laughs> I have been there uh, to. I studied him. under him. I studied <laughs> under him. Yes. <laughs> Everybody stay safe, stay healthy, please. Yeah. All right. All right. Take care. Thanks Take again. Care. Thanks, Thanks, everyone.